Have you ever had a time in your life where you did not feel accepted? It's probably not the most pleasant memory. We've all had those times, but I have some great news for you. We are gonna read a letter together that reminds us that we have liberating acceptance. I'm so glad that you're joining me for this study of the book of Galatians. It is a passionate letter written by the Apostle Paul. So if you ever hear a Pauline epistle, it's a fancy way of saying it's a letter written by Paul. He has some really good things to tell the churches at Galatia, and I think they're gonna be very relevant for us. This letter gives us a lot of contrast. He, he's talking to a group of people who he just was with less than two years prior. He shared the gospel with them. He explained to them what it really looks like to be a follower of Jesus. Now, the churches of Galatia were a Gentile group of churches. That's who Paul was called to, and we get it because we're all Gentiles. If you're not Jewish by birth and heritage, you're a Gentile. And so Paul had a unique ministry to these churches. He shared with them how passionate he was about the gospel, how life-changing it was for him and how it could do the same for them. So throughout the book, you will see a lot of contrast. He tells us that the gospel is Jesus only, that nothing needs to be added. And then he will remind us of what it looks like to be a slave versus being free, what it looks like to follow rules versus living by faith, what it looks like to walk in the spirit or give way to the flesh. You'll see a lot of contrast because he's trying to help these young believers understand what it means to be fully accepted in Jesus. This acceptance, let me tell you something, you cannot earn it. It is only by the grace and plan of God and through the obedience of Jesus and because of our faith that we have this full, unconditional acceptance. But when we don't embrace it, when we don't understand it, we can find ourselves in some situations similar to these churches in Galatia. What you're going to see in this particular letter is um, a lot of passion. Paul is a little harsh, and I think maybe that's why I relate to him, because he gives me an excuse to be very direct when it comes to the Word of God. If you look through the other letters or epistles that Paul has written, you will see that he opens by saying, by the will of God, I am Paul the Apostle. And then he'll usually spend several verses thanking them for how great they are, that they've provided him joy, he's pleased with what they're doing. Not so with the letter to Galatia. He starts off by declaring who he is, and he goes immediately into things that he's heard about them, reports that are unpleasing, reports that are making him question if they really got the message of the gospel. So you're going to see some harsh words. He says, who has bewitched you or deceived you uh, at one point in the letter? He calls them foolish. I mean, these are words that are pretty harsh for a pastor to be writing to churches that he's led. Uh, but it's, it's an urgency that's still filled with love. If you think about your kid running out into the street and about to be hit by a car, when you snatch them, you're not going to pat them on the back first. There's no time for niceties. There's an urgent situation that could change or end their life if you don't do something about it. So what you're going to see in a lot of direct language in this letter is Paul saying, this is urgent. This is not, I hope you work it out if you get a minute. This is, you have missed the gospel and you are totally going to live like the slaves you were before you heard the gospel if you don't get it. So when he talks about this acceptance, Paul is not talking just about his acceptance, even though he's gonna show us that he stands on the authority of Christ because he is accepted, we'll start with that. But what he's really saying is that you, the Church of Galatia, and us, you today, you are fully accepted. That means that God has already done the work, that you don't have to work to earn anything, it's been done. And so whatever that memory, was that may have come to your mind when I asked you what it felt to be unaccepted. I want you to know that there is not any rejection on earth, nothing you've ever experienced that is greater than the acceptance that you have in Jesus. There's not any insecurity, there's not a doubt, there's not any embarrassment, there's not any shame, there's not anything that's happened in your entire life that is greater than the acceptance that Jesus guarantees us. God loved us so much that he created a plan that we could not have ever achieved on our own. And when we don't get that, we find ourselves subject to the bondage that we were in before we even knew Jesus. So Paul is basically saying, what's the point? So what you'll see uh, as we walk through Galatians is Paul giving a very passionate and urgent but harsh assurance. There's love underneath all of this, but he's very direct because this is critical. And I think this will be so good 
for us because in the church today, we face a lot of the same issues. We struggle. We wrestle with it. We know we're accepted in our minds, but what we live out, the words we say, the thoughts that we think, they don't always support that. And, and listen, I'm talking about more than positive thinking. I'm talking about more than, than good inspirational mantras. I'm talking about understanding that the core of who you are, once you place faith in Jesus, you are transformed. You are made new. You are forever a part of the family of God. So let's jump in. Let's see what Paul says to this church that he really does love, but he gets a little harsh with. Verse 1 says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me to the church of Galatia. Verse three, four, and five get heavy really quick. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Verse five, to whom be the glory forever and ever, amen. So in the first few verses, Paul is saying, I'm not only an apostle, but I'm called by God through Jesus Christ because he knew that the Judaizers, this was a group of Orthodox Jews who had kind of mixed a little tradition with the gospel. They had the ear of the Galatians. He knew that the Judaizers were telling the Galatians that Paul had no authority because if you know a little bit about the New Testament, and if you don't, let me tell you, there were the original 12 that Jesus walked with, those disciples, and then the 11 after the betrayal of Judas. And, and most Orthodox Jews said that was it. Those were the original. Those are the apostles. So Paul kind of comes as an outlier later as he has this Damascus Road encounter. He has an encounter with Jesus and God calls him from being a persecutor of the church to now being a proclaimer of God's word. And that's a story that resonates with so many of us. But it kind of made people question his authority. And so he starts off this letter very directly saying he is not from man nor through man nor through an agency of man, some of your versions may say. Now, I think it's interesting he says that because he knows he's about to contradict things the Judaizers have said. Now, the Judaizers were Orthodox Jews, as I said before, but many of them also held position in the church. And if you know anything about church denominations, position and title can sometimes become too important in church denominations. Now, this is not to, to say anything negative about any specific denomination, but when you miss the role that God has called us to, and we make the position that man has given us bigger, we usually have problems. So Paul makes it very clear that I'm called to be who I am, not because of a position that a man has given me. I haven't been elected or appointed and this will never expire. He's making it very clear that this is a direct call from God and because of Jesus Christ. He says in verse four, he gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Now, that doesn't even have anything to do with Paul's role, but he's kind of throwing in a little bit of gospel truth. He's saying, do you understand what God has done? He's delivered us from this present evil age. He's already preparing them and letting them know we're about to dive in. We're going to refresh on doctrine because you've missed some things. So Paul explains to them his authority. He explains to them who God is and what God has come to deliver us from. And and then he says, now let's jump in even further. Look at verse six. He says, I am astonished. Now this is kind of harsh for biblical language. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and you're turning to a different gospel. He's astonished. He's taken aback. And then he says, you didn't kind of veer slightly off track. He says, you're deserting him. You have completely abandoned God who's called you to the real gospel, which is the grace of Christ, and you are turning to a different gospel. In verse seven, he says, not that there is another one. There's only one gospel. So when you get off track, you've left the gospel. There's no variations. There's no shades of gray. <laughs> it's the gospel. And if you add anything to it or take anything away, you're doing something else. He says, there's not another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Verse eight says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. He's not mincing words, y'all. He's saying that I don't care if it's an angelic being, 
anybody coming to tell you that the gospel that I've already given you has any difference or variation or needs anything added to it, they should be accursed, not reprimanded, not put in time out. This is significant. This is heresy. He's saying you've taken the work that Jesus did on the cross and through the resurrection and you're trying to alter it. Any alteration is a complete distortion of the gospel. In verse nine, he goes on and he says, as we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Now, I don't know if you have kids or nieces or nephews or godchildren, but when you are really passionate, you repeat yourself in just a matter of moments. <laughs> You're trying to make sure they get it. He says, let anyone who's telling you something different be accursed. And in the very next verse, he says the same thing again. It's kind of like, make sure you do your homework and clean up this kitchen when I come back. At, what did I say again? Homework kitchen. And if you have children that get a little distracted, you say, tell me back what I said is homework kitchen. Because you want to repeat yourself to make sure that they understand your point. So this is a bit of the parental side coming out. He's talking to a group of people who knew what the weight of a curse meant. He says it twice for emphasis. In verse 10, he goes on to say, for now, am I seeking the approval of man or God? Or am I trying to please man? If I was still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. So let's stop right there. Let's talk about a few things that this acceptance gives us. It sets us free in so many ways. One of the things it gives us is the authority that we have to stand on. Paul opens this letter saying, I have authority as an apostle because I've been accepted fully by Jesus Christ. I had a call and you cannot bring it into question. I wonder how many times we hold back or miss divine moments because we say we live in authority, but we don't really walk in the authority that Jesus has given us. Listen, this authority that Jesus gives us because we're accepted through him and by God is not just for your journal. It's not so you can feel good about yourself. It's because if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're gonna be called into situations where it's not gonna be popular. You won't always get the applause. You won't always get the likes. You won't always get the followers. You might even lose some friends. But when you stand on the authority of Jesus, you will realize that those minor rejections, those inconveniences, they don't compare to the great thing that God has called us to. Even Jesus himself relied on the authority of God. John 12, 49, Jesus says, for I have not spoken on my own authority, but the father who sent me, he himself has given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. Now, Jesus, fully God and fully man, was completely dependent and, and was proud to say that he stood on the authority of the father. How much more do we need to stand on it? I wonder how many times we are powerless in situations because we are relying on our own authority. The latest quote that we've read, the latest thing that's inspired us, whatever the current trend is, that will not change lives. I'm telling you, only the authority of Christ will do it. And you can't stand on it if you're doubting your acceptance. If you're not even sure that you have a place at the table with God because of your faith through Christ Jesus, there's no way you're going to stand on the authority of God. The authority in Jesus gives us the ability to rebuke and challenge and do it in love. Let's go back to verses six through nine. Paul says, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and you are turning to a different gospel. Not that there's another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Now that word distort is very interesting because he's actually talking about uh, what it means to transpose. It's almost like if you put in your credit card number and you make a payment online and you flip just two numbers, you'll know instantly that something's not right. He's not talking about somebody that created an entire new story. He's saying even the subtle change of the truth of the gospel is enough to call it a distortion. But it's because of the authority that he stands on that he feels like I can rebuke and I can challenge and I can do it in love. I'm fully accepted by God and I stand on the authority. I love you more than I need you to like me. That's really what it means. When I stand on the authority of God, I really don't care if you like me or if you vote for me or if I'm popular. I love you and I need you to know the truth. So he challenges them in these verses and he says, even if an angel says something different, remember, let him be accursed. If I say something different, let him be accursed. And he takes it back to another thing related to acceptance. He says, whose approval am I really seeking? Because listen, when I'm accepted in Jesus, there is not any approval on this earth that compares to knowing that when I deserved hell, 
when I deserved hell and all of my choices had me headed there, that God in his goodness created a plan and Jesus in his obedience followed that plan. And because of faith and grace, I have unconditional, liberating acceptance. The bottom line is when you embrace the acceptance that you have in Christ Jesus, nothing can shake your authority. You can be prepared to speak into any situation. And even though there may be a little bit of intimidation, nothing will shake the fact that you stand on an unwavering truth. And that's what we've all been called to do. There's more good news. Your acceptance in Jesus not only gives you an authority to stand on, it's the way you find clarity for your assignment, your calling, the thing that he's left you here to do. Yes, you. Every single person that has put faith in Jesus has been left here to do something that Jesus wants to do through you. And we see Paul explain that a little bit in these next few verses. Chapter 1, verse 15 he says, but when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. That's verse 15 and 16 of chapter one. But let me just say about verse 15, how powerful this is. Paul clearly explains that God called him from his mother's womb. Verse 15, he set me apart before I was born. What? Paul, the persecutor of Christians, the one who was anti-God? You mean to tell me that when he met Jesus on the Damascus Road, that that's not when he was called? No, that's when he knew his calling, when he accepted it. But here's the good news. God had already accepted him before Paul even believed it for himself. And that's the truth for every one of us. God had to accept us first before we could even believe it. You were set apart from your mother's womb. It doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter your history. It doesn't matter if you have a great legacy or one that maybe you're not proud of. God has a calling for you and he's had it for you since you were conceived. Without exception, you were accepted by God even before you knew it for yourself. He offered his grace, he gave us divine assignments, and he patiently waits for us to respond. Think about this. You must accept God's acceptance before you can understand your excitement. You have to accept that God has already accepted you so that you can walk in the thing that he's asked you to do. If you don't believe that he's called you to himself, you won't believe that you can speak and live and do things in his name. I love this because Paul gives us a hope. He says, it doesn't matter if you were a church boy or a church girl. It doesn't matter if you went to VBS growing up or if this is the first time you've ever stepped foot in a church or opened a Bible. God has a calling waiting for you to just say yes. He goes on in verse 16 to explain a little more. He says, he was pleased to reveal his son to me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. He had a very specific calling to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. There were already the 11 apostles there that were preaching the gospel to the Jews, but Paul had a unique calling to preach to the Gentiles. He says at the end of verse 16, I did not immediately consult with anyone. Now this is huge because this is backing up what he said in verse one, that he is an apostle not because of man or through man or an agency of man. He didn't immediately consult with anyone. In the next few verses, 17 through 24, he says, I did not go to Jerusalem, but for three years, he went to visit Cephas, who is also called Peter. He explains that he took time away, that when God called him, he didn't immediately say, I need a new outfit and an office and a plaque and a title. Sometimes when God gives us weighty direction or our heavy calling, we start to realize the huge thing he's called us to do. He will immediately call us into a season of reflection or something that even feels a little isolated. He wasn't completely alone, but sometimes God says, before you start to go full speed ahead, just take a moment and let this thing, let this seed that I've given you grow a little bit. And that's okay. So don't, don't doubt that God's called you just because he's given you a word or maybe you felt you got some clarity a year ago or two years ago. It's okay. He may be germinating that. He may be cultivating that in you for just the right moment. So Paul goes on to explain 
the critical early years of his journey, how important it was that he did not follow the orthodox plan. God called him to an unorthodox group of people. The Gentiles, you and me, we didn't grow up with all the laws and all the rules. We didn't have all the rich heritage. God has given us our heritage. He called Paul to an unorthodox group of people and he called him in an unorthodox way. Now, what's really powerful about this is that Paul is so comfortable and familiar with his story that when it's called into question, he has no problems recounting exactly what God did to bring him to this point. So here's my question. Can you tell your story? Here's exactly when I heard from God. Here's how it was affirmed by the people in my life. Here's how it was affirmed by the word of God. Here's the journey that God took me on. Personal testimony is so huge for us. It shows us that God doesn't do things without reason, that he gives us experiences in life that constantly validate what he's called us to do. Paul knew exactly the journey that God had taken him through after he received the clarity of his calling or his assignment. It's so important. Look, Revelation 12, 11 says that we conquer by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. It's so important that even as the church is brought back to life, as Jesus comes back at the end of the age, that our testimony, our story is put on par with the blood of the lamb. That not only do we need the life changing blood and resurrection of Jesus, but we need our testimony because that's how the world knows that we are witnesses, that, that God transforms us. Do you know your story? You have a responsibility. No one can tell your life story the way you can. Don't whitewash it. Don't leave out the parts that aren't popular. The end of chapter one, verse 24, Paul says, and they glorified God because of me. Isn't that the testimony we all want to have? That even with my story, even with my history, the, the least likely person that should be teaching or serving or representing Jesus in my workplace, they glorified God because of me. The Paul that was sanctioning the death of Christians that was against the church of God. They glorified God because of him. The gospel was being spread to Gentiles because of Paul. Do you know your story? Do you believe that your story has power? Don't leave out any of the unpopular bits. Jesus is using that for his purpose. So as we dive deeper into the book of Galatians, I want you to keep this with you, that we are fully accepted in Jesus Christ because of the grace of God. And that acceptance gives us the authority that we stand on and it becomes the basis by which we know our assignment. It gives us clarity, it gives us purpose. It takes away the monotony and the mundane routine life that many of us have been subject to. We have the ability to speak truth with love and grace and walk a clear path when we understand that we are accepted. Mm -hmm.